Hello everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? <coughs> can you hear me? Last row, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm I'm okay. Thank you. So um before we start, uh let's do a quick poll. Uh, totally not scientific. So, um, who here has used some kind of multi threading? Anywhere? Some form of multi threading. Okay. Who here has tried it in JavaScript? In the front end? <laughs> Back end? Okay. So, um, I take it that quite a number of people here are familiar with multi-threading and maybe also in JavaScript. So, uh, today we are going to be looking at the possibilities of multi-threading in JavaScript. What is the state of things and what can you do, what can you not do, and how can you achieve what you want to do with multi-threading in JavaScript. So, um, First of all, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name, uh, the first person to pronounce it correctly, gets a gift from me. <laughs> OK, um, who's going to try? <laughs> Chinenye. And um, my surname? Onwebu. Okay, so um, I'm from Nigeria, and my name is an Igbo name. Igbo is one of the three major, three majority languages in Nigeria, and um, I work for Yilu. Uh, I will introduce you to Yilu. I uh, work as a senior engineer, and we are based in Berlin. I live and work in Berlin. I like dogs, <laughs> and uh, I like spaces. <laughs> and finally, I like semicolons. <laughs> so now that um, I've won your hearts, uh, let's get down to business. So I uh, will start with. Uh, some things that some of you may already know, and I uh, will have some introduction to some concepts. Processes, traits, and, and coroutines. Um, what is a process? A process is an instance of an application that's being executed. Um, a process is, a process contains the state of the application that is currently running. When you're running a Google Chrome, that is a process, it contains the state of that process. The process contains the code that needs to be executed, and it contains the heap, which is a part of memory where large objects are stored. It contains the stack where currently executing functions store their local variables, and it also contains the resources, open files, networks, communications, and other stuff. And it also contains information about threads, for example, and other things that the process does. The process itself does not execute code. Um, the process only contains the state of the running application. Our processes are completely isolated from each other, even if they are processes of the same application. So here we have to Google Chrome's running, but these two Google Chrome's, as far as the operating system is concerned, they are two completely different processes. So this Google Chrome tries to access the information from the other Google Chrome. The first problem is that there is no such mechanism for it to access such information. The second problem is that even if it manages to find a way to access it, it will result in what is called um, segmentation fault which means trying to, it's trying to access memory that it does not control. And 
um, a process. Processes are usually hierarchical. Uh, if you open you, the tax manager of your computer, you probably see something like this. Uh, this means that this process, for example, started this, 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 and this process started this. Now, if you close this process, it will also close the child process. If you close launch D, it will close everything in your system. Um, in Mac, you may not be able to close launch D, but in some Linux distribution that allow you to do anything, everything, you can actually close it. Uh, I mean, you can experiment this. <laughs> and um, threads, uh, thread is a sequence of instructions that's being processed, processed by a process. Um, remember I said that the process itself does not run the code. The process not, does not represent the code that is being run. It represents these resources of this particular application. The thread is what the process uses to run the code. And a process can have one or more threads. Every process must have at least one thread. And the first, uh, the first thread is usually called the main thread. Now, threads also behave like processes in that if you close a thread, it usually closes all the threads that are child threads of that thread. So if you close the main thread, you close all the threads that the main thread started in most cases. Now, um, threads also share the resources of the main process. Here we have three threads, and each one has access to everything that the process has access to. Threads do not have um, privacy, any kind of privacy. So threads share code, threads share the heap, and threads even share the stack. Usually the stack is divided uh, to the process, uh, to the threads. I mean, it's, each thread is assigned a portion of the uh, stack, but there is no mechanism that prevents one thread from accessing the information in the stack of another thread. Threads can be interrupted by the system at any time, and this can be because the thread finished executing and just gave up control, or it could be that the thread that another thread with a higher priority came up and have to preempt the thread, and the thread will be paused. It doesn't matter what the thread is doing, it will be paused and resumed later. This information is important uh, for later. And uh, now we go to coroutines. Um, coroutines are not officially, I mean, they don't mean anything to the operating system. Coroutines are implemented by the programming language or the platform. And in JavaScript, coroutines are implemented as uh, generators. Unlike threads, they are not managed by the system. They are managed by the engine. In Kotlin, they are managed by the, Jav by the JVM. In JavaScript, they are managed by the JavaScript engine. And unlike threads, they cannot be interrupted by the operating system. The thread that is running the coroutine can be interrupted, but the coroutine itself cannot be interrupted. A coroutine has to give up control by yielding, and <coughs> after pausing in some implementation, the coroutine can actually continue executing from another thread. So coroutines are not tied to a particular thread. And they are implemented in JavaScript as generators. Um, another concept is concurrent versus parallel. Uh, who here knows what concurrency means? I guess. And parallelism? Yes. Um, concurrency is the first image, uh, a very good um, example is the um, the Red Bull canopy outside. <laughs> there is only one uh, server serving the Red Bull, 
and all of us have to queue to get a Red Bull, and they have to serve, there are four corners, they have to serve this, serve this, serve this, and serve this, so that everyone will be happy. If they start serving only this side, this side will feel like you are not giving us any Red Bull. It gives the impression that this queue is moving, this queue is moving, this queue is moving, this queue is moving, but the queues are never moving at the same point in time. At any point in time, only one queue is moving. But parallelism is the bigger canopy where we have the lunch. Uh, we have many tables and many people can be taking what they want at the same time. And parallelism and concurrency, they are not mutually exclusive. You can also add another queue here and you have parallelism and concurrency in the same system. So, um, in terms of uh, our code, each CPU core can only do one thing at a time. And by one thing, I mean it can only run one thread of code at the same time. A computer system cannot do more than one thing at the same time. Sorry, I mean a computer core. And uh, this is an illustration of how one CPU core works. Uh, it runs one thread and it passes, removes it from, uh, from the CPU, moves it to memory, and loads another thread, runs it for a while, and does the same thing. And between each run, the kernel has to do some job, which includes moving this thread to back to the memory, saving the state, and scheduling the next thread and doing some cleanup work. And this time taken by the kernel is reduces the performance of the system. Also um, here you see that we have three threads and each three of them are competing for time to run. And this means that at least, it takes at least three times the time it would take if only one thread was running for each thread to run. Okay. Um, when we add parallelism, when we add more cores, you see that we have more outputs. Threads get more time. Assuming that this, uh, that this time and this time are the same, you see that here we have uh, much more time to each thread. But it still doesn't mean that we still don't have these kernel tasks. This kernel still has to do some work. And also, we usually, in a computer system, usually have more threads than you have cores. So you still have some concurrency in each core. But when you add parallelism, it speeds up things. Um, thread safety. Uh, you remember that uh, threads can share the resources of a process, which means they have access to the memory. They have access to all the um, stack. And you also remember that they can be interrupted at any time, which means while it's adding one number to the another, it can just be interrupted. And also, uh, they can also run in parallel. So when you add these three things, you get chaos. Uh, a lot of things can go wrong. And I will illustrate. Here, uh, in an, this is an 8-bit system. I mean, most systems are 64 bits. But if I try to do that here, we are not going to have space. So uh, this is an 8-bit system, and we are trying to store a floating point number. And in the first line, we store the number 25. This is um, the, the hexadecimal representation of 25 in 32-bit uh, floating point number. This system is 8-bit, which means that it can only store one byte at a time, which means it can store only this at a time. So it has to store this, 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 and this in sequence. 
And then we reassign this variable. Of course, we may do some things, or we may do some calculations, and the result of the calculations is 290.0, and we reassign it to this x. But after storing the first byte, something happened, and this thread was suspended. And then, at that particular time, the second thread tries to read this variable. What the second thread is going to see is it's going to see this, because this has been written, but this has not been written. So it's going to, for the three uh, other bytes, it's going to see this. So the result is going to be this. And we are going to get a very strange number. Uh, when you try to debug this, you discover how, how bad your day can be. Because um, first, to reproduce this, you need to get the computer to do exactly the same thing it did before, which means it must interrupt at this point, and then this function must run exactly at this point, and that is near impossible to reproduce. So you may see this bug, and maybe the next time you see it, it may print another number, and it is very difficult to, I mean, it is the kind of problem that you have, and you just flip your laptop through the window and <laughs> <laughs> call it a day. <laughs> so um, now let's uh, get down to business, uh, multi-threading in JavaScript. Let's bring this home. Um, you must have heard this, that JavaScript is single-threaded. Um, that's true, but that's not the whole truth. Um, Actually, in JavaScript, everything runs on a different thread. The only thing that doesn't run on a different thread is your JavaScript code. When you make a network request, your JavaScript does not block. Why do you think that? Because a separate thread is handling the network request. When you do a timeout, it doesn't block because a separate thread is doing that. And the only thing that doesn't run on a separate thread is your actual code, which feels like we are being cheated. And um, multi threading in JavaScript is implemented as web workers in the browser and as worker threads in Node. Worker thread became stable this year in Node.js. Web workers has been in browsers since 2010 when Chrome released it in version 3 or 4 of Chrome. And yet, not a lot of people take advantage of it, because a lot of people think that it's not widely supported. But let's see the support for browsers. This is the browsers that support web workers. In Node.js, you do not have this problem, because you choose the version you run. For browsers, you usually worry about browser support, and 97.4% of all installed browsers support web workers. That is only 0.3%, actually 0.2 something percent less than browsers that support border radius. That is to, and I'm sure everybody here uses border radius, minus the backend guys. <laughs> and also, there is a polyfill available if you are worried about the uh, 2. Point something percent that are using IE9 or 8. So um, this is pretty safe to use. Why would you want to use it? First is that blocking the main thread is a really bad idea. So if you are doing a, if you are doing a calculation that would take more than 16 milliseconds, you are going to get a warning in Chrome. If you are doing a calculation that takes more than about 10 seconds, you are going to get this alert in Firefox, and you really do not want to get this alert in Firefox. Because if you get this alert and this, your script is stopped, that is it. Your web page is broken to the user, and the user cannot do any other thing apart from submit forms and do every other thing. If your page is uh, an interactive page, it's your, your page is left in and in the time state where you don't know if you have an error or if you don't. So, <coughs> so if you also, if you uh, perform tasks in parallel, it also makes them complete faster. 
So uh, let's move to uh, understanding web workers. Uh, creating a trading goal is, you can use this code to create a trading goal. And um, in, in case you don't know what's happening here, uh, this is a local function, this is a local function, do something. And this is a local variable do call thing. And this is the main function. This is the entry point in JavaScript. Once you enter the application, JavaScript starts from top to execute your code to the bottom. But in Go and C and some other, uh, some other languages, a function named main is the first function that uh, is executed. So this function starts the main thread, actually. This function is the entry point of the application. And here we are calling this function do something. And on, the number, on line number 18, we are calling this function, but we are calling it as what is called uh, go routines. Um, for simplicity, what this does is it runs this code in a new thread. I mean, for simplicity, it's not. Um, as simple as that. So um, here you see that we define this function here, and both the main thread and the subtrade started by the main thread can actually call this function. And when you, if, for example, inside this function, you change the value of this, it is going to be reflected in the thread that you just started. So in Go and in C and in Java, the thread has access to the local scope that it was that the function was defined that was defined in, and it has access to everything that it doesn't differentiate between a function that is running in a thread and a function that is running in sorry a function that is running in a sub thread and a function that is running in the main thread. Now in JavaScript things start to get a little weird, like everything JavaScript. Um, here to create a thread, you have to create a worker. And instead of passing it a function to run, you actually pass it a file to compile. And what this does is that it will download this file and compile it and run it as a completely different JavaScript instance. It is not a different JavaScript instance, but it will run it as if it is one. Now, the implication is that there is no way to access this function from inside this worker. So this worker and the main thread are completely isolated. Not completely, but for our purpose here, they are completely isolated. And another thing to note is that this function, this um, file, must obey the cause rules. If you have had problems with cause, can I see your hands up? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Cause also comes back to bite you in workers. And if you are using data and blob URIs, you also need to obey the CSP rules. This is uh, contents, um, content security policy. And um, this does, does not work in with file, with uh, Luca file system. So you have to set up a, a server to be able to create a worker. So uh, the threads in JavaScript, they behave like isolated processes. They are actually threads. They are not separate processes, but they behave as if they are separate processes. And nothing is shared between the threads apart from a few things. And one of them is the shared array buffer. Uh, the console is also shared. Console, so you can do console.log from the worker and a few other things, but the main thing that is shared is shared array buffer. And um, the communication is only through uh, inter-thread communication pro provided by the JavaScript engine. So you cannot access a variable defined in that thread from, uh, from the main thread, for example, or a variable defined in the main thread from a sub-thread. Um, some data types can be transferred from one thread to another. Uh, these include array buffer, message port, and some uh, 
object that implements this interface called transferables, when you transfer an object from a thread to another thread, it basically disappears from the current thread. You will not be able to access it anymore. Um, we'll come to that. We'll have uh, some live session. And how do we create web workers? We've shown this, and um, now we are going to do some coding. And uh, I put this here in the slide so that you can have a look at it when you get the slides. So um, now we are going to try to create a worker. And so um, since we need to set up HTTP server to create a worker, uh, which I do not want to do. I wrote a small function that can allow us to create a worker without creating a server. And um, this uh, takes advantage of the blob and blob URL. So um, we are going to copy this code. It's going to form the basis of everything we are going to do. Um, you do not need to worry. I will uh, give out the URL for this whole code. Uh, it's on GitHub. So you can just open any website. And I choose my favorite website, which is my company website. You can do this on advertisements. And um, in the console, I'm going to make it really big. Can you see? OK, so uh, we are going to have to magnify. OK? Yep. So uh, we want to create a worker. And this is the function that creates a worker for us. And what this function basically does is that it creates a blob with the text of the JavaScript file that we want to put in the worker. And it gives us a URL that when we open, we are going to see the worker. Um, we are going to see the file, I mean. And it returns the worker itself, so we don't need to uh, call new worker again. So to create a worker, we just do new worker. Of course, this is easy. And um, in the worker file, you can enter anything you want. And sending a message to worker is very easy. So uh, we are going to create a worker. Oh, I'm going to use var so that we can redefine this. Uh, and we are going to put our worker code in here. So uh, what do you want this worker to do? Just print a message that says, I am a worker. So you see it's did it almost immediately. But um, now we are going to try to send a message to this worker. And to send a message to this worker, we are going to have to do this dot post message. This is really simple, I hope. And um, we've just sent a message to the worker. But of course, nothing happened because we did not receive the message from the worker. We did not define how we want to receive the message from the worker. So we are going to redefine our worker to receive messages. And how do you define, how do you receive a message? You, in workers, you have um, some global uh, variables that you can define. And one of them is on message. This is an event that will receive any message sent to this worker from either the main thread or another thread. So uh, this will contain the message. And this message, we have uh, a property called data. This will contain data will contain the message that was sent from uh, the main thread. This message also contains some other data that are general events uh, general event properties like is trusted, is cancelable, and all the other things that events contain. But what we are really interested in is this. And we are going to print this. 
received from main uh, data. So now we can send a message to the data and to the worker and you see this. And here you can see where the log is coming from, which is uh, our blob uh, URL. You can also send not just simple messages, you can send objects. You can send anything you want, but there are some things you cannot send. You cannot send a function. If you send a function, it's going to crash. And uh, we are going to try that. And uh, we are going to try to send. Uh, so I'm going to use my name so you memorize it. And uh, what else? I, I intentionally sent a date so that you see that it actually reconstructs it on the other side. And um, let's say array is um, so um, it actually receives it on the other side, and this is what it receives. It actually receives the date as a date object on the other side, and it receives the array as an array on the other side. And but when you send this message, this object that you receive is not the same thing as the object you sent. The object you sent is, uh, how is it said again? It's uh, serialized and sent over to the worker and deserialized on the worker. So you have, the two of them are completely different objects. They may have the same structure as they had before, Arrays will be deserialized to arrays, dates will be deserialized to dates, and all that, but they are very different objects. And we are going to see what happens if you try to send, um, if you try to send, uh, if you try to send our, our uh, self-defined object. So let's say we have a class user, and uh, And then we say uh, we say this dot id equal to id, and then we are going to define some um, we are going to define some methods. We are going to please uh, forgive me for my good formatting. It's difficult to format code on the console, and set id. And this dot id equal to id. So what happens if we send this to the worker? We are going to receive this object, but as a plain object. And why is this? Because JavaScript we do not have this class on the other side. So it does not know how to reconstruct this. So it will just transfer it as a plain object. And if you try to call any method of this uh, user object on the other side, it's going to fail because the function does not exist. This is just a plain object. It's not a user object. Even if you have the user class on the other side, it will not reconstruct it. And what happens if you try to send a function? Uh, can you guess? Can you guess? You cannot transfer a function. You cannot send a function. It, doesn't know how to serialize it, and is going to fail. So um, this may look as if it's limiting, and it is very limiting. But when you consider the market for JavaScript, which is uh, the web, which has a fair number of inexperienced developers, you 
we understand why it's like this because if you open the web up for first class uh, multi trading, you are going to have a lot of websites that just do not render. And um, so uh, let's move on. Uh, we've already seen how we can receive message from the worker. And sending message from the worker is almost the same thing. You just post message without, in, in, the, must, in the main, you prefix it with worker because you have the handle for the worker. In the worker, you don't press fix it. So this is the only difference. And um, let's uh, try to transfer an object. So we are going to transfer an array buffer. Who here knows what an array buffer is? Array buffer, JavaScript array buffer. Um, in JavaScript, an array buffer is basically a chunk of memory that holds some data. And you can decide how you want to read this data. And uh, I'm going to show an example. Uh, so buffer is a new array buffer. And how many bytes do we want it to have? Eight bytes. And this buffer, you can read it anyhow you want. You want to read this buffer as, uh, as a tattoo bit integer. So we are going to create a new signed array, a new uh, tattoo bit integer array. And we do that by, uh, let's call this u32. So this array is not a regular array. This array is based on this buffer that we created before. And we can create a float array from this same buffer. And now we are going to set the first byte of this data, the first uh, uh, 32 bits of this data, which is uh, U320 equal to 40, we are setting it as an unsigned integer. And we can also read it, and it's going to return this. If you try to read it from the float, oh, I made a mistake. No one corrected me. <laughs> This is a float 32. So if we read this as a float, we are going to get something very strange. Uh, this this trying to uh, interpret 40 unsigned integer as a float gives you a number that is completely different. So you have to know at each position the format of the data at that position. So uh, that said, let's try to transfer this buffer to our uh, worker. So we say buffer is a buffer. And then to transfer it, you include it in this second parameter. So the worker receives it, but now the uh, problem is that you can see that all the data that we stored in it is still here. Remember, we saved this data from the master. Now the problem is that on the main thread, we can no longer access this buffer. So when we log this data, it is now empty because we've transferred it to the thread. It, you can also just send this buffer to the thread without transferring it, it will just clone it. But in this case, it does not clone it, it transfers the actual memory. And this may seem like there is no difference between the two, but um, in actual sense, if you, are, if you care about performance, this, the, uh, there is a big difference. Also, uh, so that you keep in mind, if you want to make sure that 
you do not edit uh, that you do not edit um, a buffer after after sending it it is best to transfer it because then if you try to edit it it's going to give you an error okay so um, using shader array buffer shader array buffer is special in that you can actually that's the only thing you can share between threads in JavaScript so you can send a buffer to a shader array buffer to a thread and both threads can operate on it and of course this is going to cost you a lot of trouble if you don't know what you're doing so uh, we are going to try to send a shader array buffer and uh, it's important to note that shader array buffers are not transferable if you include it in the transfer list it's going to give you an error because you share it you do not transfer it so how do we uh, create one we can just uh, reuse our buffer I'm lazy um, let's reduce this to four and Okay, so we are going to send this to um, our worker. If we include it here, we are going to get an error. Oh, sorry, buffer, not. If we include it here, we are going to get an error because you cannot transfer it. So the uh, worker receives it. Now we are going to do some fun things with uh, the shared array buffer. And what are we going to do? We are going to try to modify it from uh, the main thread and we have the worker read it. So we are going to have to recreate our worker, our, our worker and um, yep. So uh, we are going to set interval and for uh, in every one thousand milliseconds. We are going to print the content of, of the shared array buffer. If you're not following me, you can tell me. So uh, we need to create the array. Is this clear? Is it? Okay, so um, now we are going to uh, post the. Oh, we are going to post this, and every second is going to give us the results. And in the main thread, we are going to also have to increment it. Because if we don't increment it, it's not going to uh, show something. So the worker is now seen nine. So uh, you see the worker and the master are sharing the same buffer. You can use this for communication, for very fast communication. And it is really fast compared to post message. But you can you have to be also very careful. Um, now, uh, you remember when we have this image? Now, uh, shared array buffer can put you in this situation because you are now sharing something, and this is the only thing you can share in JavaScript. Actually, shared array buffer is disabled in most browsers apart from Chrome. 
So you have to keep that in mind. And why is disabled? It's because of uh, a timing attack. Uh, it's going to be re-enabled, but currently it is disabled in all browsers except Chrome. So uh, to use shared array buffers safely, you have to use them with Atomics. I'm sorry if you, if you expected uh, some Node.js examples. This is quite similar to Node.js uh, worker thread. So everything here also applies, to, most things here also applies to worker threads in Node.js. So there is no need to repeat both of them. With Atomics, you can perform concurrent operations safely or mostly safely. Um, it allows you to make sure that no two threads are trying to write the same value at the same time. So um, it is safe and it is fast because it uses hardware instructions. But one thing to note is that it only works with 32 uh, bit integers mag maximum. It doesn't work with 64 bits. So um, let's try to use uh, shared array buffer with atomics. And in this example, we are constantly printing this uh, value, whether it changes or not. Now we are going to try to print it only when it changes. This does not present a real life situation, but uh, it will drive home the point. So now instead of doing this, we are going to have to wait until the value changes. So instead of using uh, set interval, we are going to wait until the value changes. And the change we are going to see here is, um, also note that uh, some atomic uh, Operations only take uh, signed integers. So uh, if you are doing uh, wait and um, wait and notify, we are going to need to use signed integers. Uh, you can, I left the references in my slides, which I'm going to share at the end of this. So you can look them up. So uh, let's create I32. And we are going to wait. First of all, we are going to get the current value, which is um, or we are going to use atomics to read it. The load. position zero, and we no longer need this. And, sorry. Um, we are going to be creating an infinite loop. <laughs> And um, I'm going to explain what's happening here later. So this is how. So this is our worker, and now we are going to be repeating what we did before. We create our buffer, and here we create a signed integer, and we are going to post this buffer to um, the worker. You see, it's 
actually printed only once and suspended. Why? Because here it calls atomic dot weight. This will suspend this thread if this value is equal to the value at index zero. So it reads it, and as long as this value remains the same, it's not going to change. And to uh, make it to update, we are going to set the value. And then we are going to notify it. We are going to notify one thread. And it prints the next value. So we can, if you want, we can do this in a loop. Are you still following me? So now it's going to, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> I, <laughs> so for simplicity, we are going to do this, plus one. You can also do atomic.add, or you can also do atomic.swap. Uh, you can swap the value, the current value with something else. So uh, here we are getting, yeah, the other uh, interval is already, <laughs> the other interval is, is uh, overwriting it. So um, I hope this was enough. And uh, so uh, now let's uh, put this to use in an actual application. Um, I'm not going to elaborate much on this because uh, I have the code on GitHub so you can look at it and see it in real life. I mean, this is not a very useful application, but it illustrates the point very well. So uh, this is Amanda brought a uh, fractal, and I've always wondered how to draw this until I found out how, and I found out how easy it was to draw. And uh, this is not ours, obviously, but we are going to draw ours. And, um, this is, uh, the code is here in my GitHub. Um, you can take a picture uh, in five, four, three. So uh, we are going to go through this and uh, we are not going to go through the code. We are just going to go through the, um, I'm just going to show you a few things and here, we are going to render this fractal, and uh, that is not as fine as the original. <laughs> but uh, why is it not fine? Is because we reduce the iterations because I wanted to illustrate something. And here we are not using threads; we are we are doing this purely on the main thread. And we are using only 20 illustrations. Um, you can read how this is uh, generated. We are using only uh, 20 iterations, which makes this look rough. And you can see that it takes 2.9 seconds to render in the main thread. The problem is not the 2.9 seconds. The problem is that within those 2.9 seconds, the user of this application cannot do anything else. So let's increase this to 2000, for example. So I'm trying to click, and I cannot click, so now I can select. But while this is rendering, I cannot do anything because I am blocking the main thread. If we increase it to 20,000, it is a different story altogether. Now I cannot select anything. I cannot click. In Chrome, you cannot even refresh. Oh, you can. Sorry. <laughs> 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 but um, you, you get the point? It's, it's actually not refreshing. It's loading, but it's going to wait until this is done before it refreshes. So we are basically stuck. 
because we are blocking the main thread. In Firefox, we are actually going to get um, this creepy message, which I don't think anyone wants to see on their website. Um, it's rendering. You can see I close the stuff and okay. So if we increase this to more, we are going to get the slow uh, alert. I think they changed that to be nicer. It's rendering. So it's now asking us to stop the script or wait for it because we are blocking the main thread. So how do we improve this? Um, we also cannot zoom. We also cannot zoom while this is rendering in single thread. We cannot move around while it's rendering in single thread. But um, in multi-thread, we can set this to use multi-thread by uh, in the repository. We can change use stress to true. Sorry. And uh, this is building with Webpack, so it's going to. So it still takes a lot of time to render, but um, sorry. Oh, I think my Firefox is is still rendering. <laughs> now I have to kill it. Mm. Okay, so um, sorry, this is not using uh, threads. Sorry, just five more minutes. Okay, so uh, let's try this again. No. Oh, sorry, I know what the problem is. It's catching it. So we have to open. Uh, we have to open DevTools to disable the catch. So now you see that even though it's not responding as, even though it's not fast, it's still three seconds to render, it at least allows me to change things while it's rendering. It allows me to do stuff while it's rendering. And this is using only one thread. So this is not improving the speed but it's already improving the user experience and no matter how long it takes the browser is not going to ask us to kill the application and we can make this even faster by increasing increasing the number of threads to 12 and this is going to cut down the number to 450 milliseconds and we can see the big difference from 3000 or 2000 milliseconds to this is almost 10 times uh, speed improvements just by starting 12 threads you can see how this is imp implemented in the code so we can also um, there is also a part of it that uh, you can configure for it to use a shared array buffer instead of using um, instead of using a post message um, you can go through the code and see I made it in such a way that is easier to follow instead of uh, making it efficient so you can understand how this is done so the whole point is that this can already be used in the real world and this does not just improve performance it greatly improves user experience and you can use this today the browser support for this is really really good and um, just as final notes uh, um, you have to keep a few things in mind that sometimes you do not want to start more threads than you have uh, cause. 
And in the browser, you can check the number of calls using this command. In Node, you can check the number of calls. And sometimes having more calls than having more threads than calls can actually slow down your application. So if you have 12 calls, my computer has 12 calls, and I start 120 uh, threads, it's going to run completely slower than uh, it should with 12 calls, with 12 threads. And uh, web workers do not have access to the DOM, so any DOM operation you are performing must be done on the main thread. There are some other things it does not have access to, but I don't have them off. Hard. Uh, you can uh, also always go through uh, MDN to find them. Alternative to multi-threading, you can use GoRoutines uh, generators. I mean, some people actually like to do complicated stuff. But <laughs> I mean, before multi-threading was uh, mainstream in JavaScript. I don't know if it's mainstream, but before it was widely available, you could simulate this with generators. Not that you can multi-thread, but you can prevent your task from uh, blocking the main thread by using generators. And you can use request idle callback. This allows you to uh, ask the CPU, ask uh, the uh, JavaScript to tell you when it's free, when it has some free time to execute your code. But the problem with this is that it also tells you how long you have. It tells you that you have 10 milliseconds, and you must fit your task within those 10 milliseconds. If you don't fit it within those 10 milliseconds, nothing will happen, but you will degrade the user experience. And you can always use the legacy child process.fuck, which is just an inferior uh, version of um, worker threads in Node. Uh, of course, with uh, the coming support of um, multi-threading in WebAssembly, you can also use WebAssembly if you feel like uh, JavaScript multi-threading is a lot of hassles. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I think we can uh, take one or two questions. OK. Um, how does this work in relation with the event loop? Um, the event loop, um, the, uh, each thread has its own event loop, so they do not block each other. So when you call um, set timeout here and set timeout here, they are very independent. They have different uh, stack and heap. Yes, they have, everything is different. I mean, it's the same memory chunk as long as the computer is concerned, but as far as JavaScript is concerned, they are separate. Uh, I, at the beginning, I said that they are threads that behave like processes. So they have their own event loop. Okay. Yep. Question? OK. How do you keep the worker what is not needed anymore? Um, workers, you have the handle for the worker. You can just call worker.terminate, and it will die. Actually, in the uh, Mandelbrot, uh, if you spin up 12 uh, threads, for example, and let us spin up and let us change it to two, you'll see the code where I kill the remaining 10 of it. So uh, they are all in the code example. Any more questions? Well, thank you then. And we are hiring.